This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha and welcome to Think Tech Hawaii and it never got quiet. This is a half hour program that explores the Hawaiian connection with the Vietnam War. I'm your host, Vic Kraft. The recent Ken Burns documentary on the Vietnam War has been unsettling to many people. In previous programs here, we have explored the observations and feelings of our guests on the conflict in Southeast Asia. On today's program, we have three guests, one volunteer, one draftee, and one who served in the Peace Corps during the time of the war. We will be discussing three questions as our topic today. One, are there any lessons to be learned from the Vietnam War, and if so, what are they? Two, have we learned from those lessons? And three, if not, what can we do in the future? Our first guest served in our country in another capacity other than force of arms. Peter Adler volunteered for duty with the Peace Corps, serving in India from 1966 to 1968. He earned degrees in English, history, community development, and interdisciplinary science. Peter was the president of the prestigious Keystone Policy Center in Colorado for nearly a decade and returned to Hawaii heading up Accord 3.0 Consulting. Peter has also held executive positions with the Hawaii Justice Foundation, the Hawaii Supreme Court Center for Alternative Dispute Resolution, and the Neighborhood Justice Center. Peter has written extensively with his latest book on his experience in the Peace Corps titled India 40. Our second guest has been on this program before, Miles Nishimoto. Miles was attached to the 1st Air Cavalry in the Central Highlands between 1966 and 1967. Miles received the Bronze Star and the Purple Heart and was medically discharged from the Army after spending two and a half years at Tripler. He went on to a successful career uh, in the import-export business here in Honolulu. Our third guest is Ken Kupchak, who has also appeared here before. Ken was commissioned in the United States Air Force after attending Cornell University and receiving a degree in chemistry. <coughs> He subsequently earned a degree in meteorology from Penn State. Ken served on General Mobire's staff as weather briefing officer in Saigon. Ken attended Cornell again to obtain law a law degree specializing in international affairs. Ken returned to Hawaii and has been practicing law since then. It took Ken Burns and Lynn Novick 18 hours to tell their story of the Vietnam War. I sincerely doubt we can come to any substantive conclusions here in, in the next 28 minutes, but we're gonna try. Welcome, gentlemen. Miles, since you were the draftee in this group, what are your thoughts about the three questions? Well, let me just reference the first question. <clears throat> what can, what about the legacy of Vietnam? And I think uh, many of us would agree that the effects of Vietnam conflict didn't just end in 1973 when the troops started working in the country. As a matter of fact, when they came back to the U.S., the Soldier, American soldier was confronted by a couple groups. The first group was a faction that was more or less known as the protesters, the people who were really against this war. The other group, so-called supporters. But then, of course, I mean, after hearing the responses from the riot group or the non-supporters was, boy, we got labeled like, here it is, we're civilian killers. Wow, we didn't feel too good about that. And then the so-called supporters said, oh, by the way, you know, it's a good thing we did a good job down there. But sorry to say we didn't win the war. So you can see the veteran was really caught in between. And the way he felt was that his overall total services to the country was not really appreciated. And what do we really contribute this to? There's several different things, but I can still come down to one, I think this one factor could be a big contributor. First of all, the government, I think, was not very sincere and open and truthful with us. For one thing, there were hidden agendas. Take, for example, this one veteran who told me, you know, Miles, I felt like a mushroom growing in the dark. I was never informed about different situation. Why do we need to do that? What is the purpose? I mean, it was given that, hey, the four months of practice and uh, uh, basic training that we had was sufficient enough to make us professional soldiers now. How can it be we come into a country which was originally controlled by more than a decade, more than 100 years to the generations, and here it is, with four months training we come into this country, being able to conquer the world. Almost impossible. 
But then, of course, when you look at a good example of the government holding back some information on us, is what about Agent Orange? Agent Orange, when we were communicated about the reasons for Agent Orange, <clears throat> and it was mainly uh, this uh, product was to destroy all of the foliage, the thick jungle, that would kind of uh, minimize the hiding area or camouflage areas for the uh, enemy. Failing to realize that, hey, if this product could destroy the foliage, what about us? Mm -hmm. But there was no communication on the effects that it would have for not only the enemy, but even for us as the veterans who serve in the country. We went down after they destroyed the area, <clears throat> and we crashed through the jungle. We've got this Agent Orange all over our arms, face, everything else. And then when it comes down to the water area, there's a scream. We don't have fresh water every day. So we fill up our canteens, put in a purification tablet, put in a little bit of Kool-Aid in there, shake it, and we drink it. Why? Boy, that flavor water is tasting very good, you know? <laughs> but again, failing to realize that here it is now, that dioxins are in our bodies too. So what about the future impact that it could have for us as the veteran? But you know, over the years, <clears throat> I've known several people who have filed claims about, gee, it stemmed first from being diabetic. Next thing you know, there's kidney problem. Next thing you know, there's some heart problem. All of which was originally from H&R. Mm -hmm. This one person that I know of just recently is on, has been on dialysis. He's been on dialysis now for three times a week for the past six months, I think. And he's in a situation right now where his claims have still been denied. Can you believe this? It's still been denied, mm -hmm. even with the situation that is in currently today. So this is another example about, wow, how the government deals specifically with numbers, yet when it comes to, hey, two things about the veterans, I'm sorry, we can't scope out that. But the bad thing about this is that I've known so many of the veterans that have passed. And till the day that it passed, they never was granted what was due to them. So when we talk about it, it never got quiet. One way to think about it, for those veterans, it finally got quiet. Mm -hmm. And it's sad to say that I think they were just really, we all were taken advantage of by not being shared the truth to a lot of incidents. So that's, that's my impression on what do I need to say about it. Peter, you uh, <clears throat> served in a civilian capacity, and uh, I know you from other places, and of course, uh, you were willing to serve in any capacity, but you chose the Peace Corps. How is your view of all this? I mean, when you came back from India, things had to have been in turmoil, and uh, What's the legacy of all this? I mean, we were it was a revolution going on at that time. You know, I think uh, people today don't know very much about the Vietnam War era and how turbulent those times were. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I talk to younger folks, it's like we could be talking about the French and Indian War or something like that. Yeah. And I don't think they understand the turbulence. I think Ken Burns' series is maybe, you know, teaching. It's kind of, Maybe there's some teaching in that. I think one of the legacies of that era, and of the war in particular, is uh, a tremendous mistrust of government and a lack of confidence in leadership. Uh, we suffer because of that, but it's also, that's the legacy, and the, Vietnam was the precipitating piece of that. I mean, there was some of that before, but you know, people like you guys stepped up and you were there. Uh, that happened in Korea, it happened in World War II, uh, but since then, I think things are different. It's, it's curious you mentioned that as far as Korea and Vietnam. I think there is a, a difference in the way we prosecuted war and for the reasons we did. Yeah. Uh, one of our prior guests made the comment about having a goal. If we were sent to Vietnam, what was the goal? Right. Uh, World War II, we had some definitely bad people to deal with. Uh, in Vietnam, come to find out through the Ken Burns uh, documentary that uh, they're just like us, folks. Uh, maybe you had a different form of government, but whatever. And, and I think the, the, what comes out so strong in the series, which we all, many of us, thought, was we were being lied to. Mm -hmm. We were being lied to systematically over three presidencies. 
that and presidents who were, had other agendas. I mean, the domino theory was in the background, and there were lots of other things going on. Uh, there's always politics, and politics is uh, tough and complicated, but fundamentally, you guys paid the price on the ground for that. And we'll never forget that, those of us who lived through that. I, I think Miles and my thoughts are with the guys that we left behind. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I can remember seeing the stacked body bags uh, in the C-130s and yeah. whatever. Ken, you were not necessarily in a safe position, but uh, you survived Tet in Saigon, and uh, we discussed that on the, the previous program. Uh, <clears throat> we tend to laugh at those things now, and at the time when we were experiencing them, <laughs> it wasn't that funny. No, I've never been so scared in my life. <laughs> but, uh, the issue of uh, legacy, what did we learn? primary thing that uh, hopefully we learned is never to do it again. Yeah. And uh, that, that's a very complex situation. There's a book, Embers of War, that leads to the, uh, tells about the lead up to the war. And uh, we were Ho Chi Minh's buddy uh, during World War II, helping him, and it fit in with Roosevelt's uh, contest of, uh, we're gonna get rid of colonialism, we're gonna have democracy around the world, and it helped have people flock to us, where they were leaving the British Empire and they couldn't get their own colony troops to fight for them at the beginning of the war. We come in with this idea, it's in the Atlantic Charter of you know, the and world, the United rights Nations freedoms, yeah. and human rights. But after the war, Roosevelt dies and uh, Harry Truman comes in, he's not schooled in world diplomacy and he's talked into uh, the domino theory and we let Ho Chi go. Um, it's been a pretty much an independence battle from the beginning from colonialism. And we were in there trying to do something. First, the French threw in the towel, and we made them continue for a couple more years. So finally, we had to bail them out and go in ourselves. Uh, and that's when the problem started. We set up pretty much everything the wrong way. Tom Sterling talked on your program about the fact that we every 12 months we rotated. People mm -hmm. are coming and going every day. No learning curve. Everybody <laughs> making the same mistakes. I was uh, 24 and 25. I was in the command post for Vietnam. Uh, I did all the go, no go forecasts for the missions over Hanoi, and I briefed General Westmoreland daily during Quezon and Tet on various things. So I was the fly on the wall. I could see what was going on. Another lesson I learned there, or observed firsthand, was a lack of communication between DC and the field. Uh, I used the example on our last program of sending a mission over the north and having it canceled halfway by the Red Phone out of Washington and we had to drop our bombs in the Gulf and come back home. And the generals would stand around and swear and bitch about the people in Washington didn't understand this war, couldn't do it. And I got back to law school and we had Nicholas Katzenbach, uh, who was at the other end of that phone as the Attorney General, one of the people there, came up to our law review for a cocktail party and I asked him the same question. His response was, those darn generals, they didn't know what was going on. And I, from this, I concluded that we had a tremendous communication gap. Yeah. Uh, previous people mentioned that uh, we didn't know why we were there, why we were fighting. There was no coherent program, and we couldn't have communication between the field and home. And it was, um, it was scary. And then we come home, as Miles mentioned, and uh, you were not supposed to uh, show your uniform. Or you were the enemy. And that, uh, hopefully we've learned that when they came home from the first desert storm, they gave them parades and everything, and it, it helped the transition well, I, the I think, it, I think it helped the troops, but uh, that it helped the nation. I think trying to, uh, you know, putting bumper stickers on the car that said we support our troops doesn't necessarily mean we support our yeah, troops. It, what, the volunteer army problem yeah. is a problem. Yeah. And Vietnam is one of its legacies. Well, I'll tell you what, let's talk about that when we come back. Right now, let's take a break and uh, listen to these messages. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. But I have a story, and I don't know where to start. I feel alone in the crowd. I can't sleep. I feel overwhelmed. I don't even know who I am anymore. I still have nightmares. I can't live like this anymore. I'm really not so good. But are you ready to listen? Hello, 
I'm Helen Dora Hyden, the host of Voice of the Veteran, seen here live every Thursday afternoon at 1 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. As a fellow veteran and veterans advocate with over 23 years experience serving veterans, active duty, and family members, I hope to educate everyone on benefits and accessibility services by inviting professionals in the field to appear on the show. In addition, I hope to plan on inviting guest veterans to talk about their concerns and possibly offer solutions. As we navigate and work together through issues, we can all benefit. Please join me every Thursday at 1 p.m. for the Voice of the Veteran. Aloha! Welcome back. We were discussing uh, volunteerism and the draft. And uh, I'd like to get into that a little bit as far as uh, discussing. We gave up the draft uh, in 73, and uh, now we're doing what? We've got a volunteer army. Uh, are we making the same mistakes that we did with Vietnam? I look at Iraq and Afghanistan. I've had friends who were in the intelligence community basically say, we didn't do our homework. Now we have a volunteer army <clears throat> that we can send wherever we want because they're mercenaries. Essentially, they're getting paid for their job. Do you think that perhaps maybe having the draft and allowing kids and their, their families becoming more involved in where their kids were and what they were doing, do you think that might have had some kind of an impact on uh, foreign policy or at least us getting out of Vietnam? Take it up. Go again. Uh, well, one of the reasons we went to the all volunteer army was the drug problem in Vietnam. Uh, it was it was horrendous, and uh, even the troops that came back and were in Germany and fighting against the Russian potential, uh, they couldn't field the, the troops, so they had to go to do something to clean it out. Now that they've cleaned it out, uh, it creates other problems uh, that there's no buy-in from the rest of the country. Uh, exactly. And we talked a little bit before about the idea of volunteer or nationwide service in some capacity. It didn't have to be military. Mm -hmm. It could be public health service. could be Peace Corps. could be the service. But if everybody was expected to give a couple of years to their country and you picked where you wanted to serve, we probably wouldn't have any problem staffing it, and there would be buy-in from the whole country into what we're doing. Do you think that it might have some influence on, on our politicians in making the decisions like the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution or the Patriot, Re uh, Patriot Act? You're, you're the lawyer. You <laughs> <laughs> Never in doubt, frequently wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know, um, my, my, I don't know what the, I can't say what it would have affected, but I think we're talking about a major social and cultural change. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's hard to see the value of service when you're in it, especially if you're young. You have many motives and many reasons and many forces working on you. But we know, and from our own discussions, we've, we've talked about how retrospectively important that was in our lives. And we know that right here. Well, uh, Miles even mentioned it in the program yep. that started this all off, and that was the value that he learned from being in the military. People tend to look at it as... Deep, deep stuff. Yeah, it, we, we tend to look at it as being... Well, you're in a disciplined organization, but basically you're learning self-discipline. Yeah. And we carry that with us, plus the leadership uh, that, that goes along with it. And it's not just <clears throat> learning from the leaders, is you're now put in positions of leadership. I stopped to think, you know, I was 21-year-old crew chief of a multi-million dollar weapon system. So, uh, so think about that for a second where you, and a friend of mine was in the Peace Corps in Korea and around well, simultaneous with our careers, uh, recently told me, he said, you know, that's, it, imagine you're, you know, somewhere between 19 and 22, and you're put into positions of responsibility, you get treated, he, he was treated like an adult. He said it was the first time he was mm -hmm. actually expected to perform accountable, he had to do stuff. So, uh, I mean, that's unusual. We don't see much of that now. We don't see that kind of expectation. Yeah. That's what worries me. Yeah. <clears throat> My take on the areas of responsibilities and uh, what I've learned from it is when I first went there, I was a regular infantryman. But then, of course, casualty rates happen at such a fast pace. Before I know it, I was like an NCO in charge of a squad. 
And then from there, they had sent me to additional training, at which time we belonged to the LERP team. Now, as a LERP team, we thought, oh my God, I mean, you know, I hope I can go ahead and extend some leadership skills on this. We should explain for the, <laughs> what a LERP is, a Long Range Reconnaissance Patrol. Correct, yeah. Um, so you go out in an enemy territory, and uh, for X number of days, you've got a small team, up to maybe four to five people maximum, at which time you're reporting in any type of uh, enemy uh, movements or any type of uh, uh, activities that has been happening. But at that time, I don't know what had actually happened. Uh, I was a draftee, like I said originally, right? And I went in there with just the intent of doing what I just needed to do. Failing to realize that all of a sudden now I'm in a leadership position, and if yeah. I fail, I had failed these people's lives. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it became such a stressful position that I received no real training for prior to mm -hmm. going in country now. Yeah. It was like an immediate on-the-job training, which, wow, it created a lot of stress. Well, I'm I, I sure. think you and I had different training that uh, <laughs> yeah. we were expected to uh, perform. <laughs> it's, it, you live up to your expectations. Yeah. And the military yeah. gives you structure. And uh, I, when it came time when enlistment would end for one of our enlisted troops, uh, if they had plans to go to college or something like that, I'd encourage them to go for it. If they didn't, I encourage them to stay because we, we're family and we take care of our people mm -hmm. and we educate them. And there's always... OJT going on in all sorts of areas on it. So yeah. it's one way to grow up and yes. uh, have a family supporting you. I have a, a good friend of mine who's in Canadian Forces, or just retired from Canadian Forces. He made the comment, he, had, he went to uh, one of the NCO academies uh, mm -hmm. that the Air Force sponsored. He said he learned teamwork more yeah. there than he did when he was in Canadian Forces. Yeah, but your life depends on it. Yeah, and he said <laughs> never in his life did he ever want to become more of an American than he at that point in time. Huh. I thought that was an interesting observation. And I'm thinking we have such a divisiveness in this country right now. How do we mend that? How do we fix that? The one place for the least divisiveness is in the service. Yeah. <laughs> so you learn a lot about yourself when you grew up in a small community and you come together people from all over the country. And it enables you to expand your horizons and be a better citizen, I think, in the long run. Well, I think, Peter, you had a similar situation, too, because you were thrown in India 40. You started off with a group of people in your training. We were, and we did a lot of work together. We also worked individually. It was the same kind of thing. It was a growing up. And, you know, we, were, we weren't under fire the way you guys were or in the middle of a war <coughs> uh, directly as you were. But we were, you know, killing rats and raising chickens and building schools and water wells and trying to do things that we've been taught to do and try to move move it forward. And um, there was accountability. We had resources that we were accountable for. And, and uh, it, well, growing up is the exactly right yeah. word. And it's just to me, it's interesting how you, how hard it is to see that when you're in it. I mean, growing up is not something you're just kind of aware of, but retrospectively, you see it. And that's part of the reason why I'm really for some kind of national service program uh, with a lot of options, with lots and lots of options. We, we need that. We've got to have it. <laughs> right now we're sort of goalless. Yeah, and, and, and that's we're talking <coughs> men and women. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and one of the things that I, I have seen, though, with uh, a lot of the pro professional uh, officers who object to the idea of having a, a citizen army, uh, they will cite the statistics that were, I think, somewhat skewed, saying, well, the draftees took the, the brunt of the uh, the casualties in Vietnam. Well, they were the brunt of the people yeah. in Vietnam. That's right. That's right. So, yeah, it's, it, it's got to work that way. But, he, it, yeah, it, the leadership that you learn as we're growing up, like I said, I said, we're treated like adults. Yeah. And you're now expected to do things. And, you know, you were a junior officer. I was a junior NCO. And... Uh, you, know, you still had things that you were mentored by with other people. And I think that was part of the process, too. You had experienced people teaching you. Not so much in your case, Miles, I don't think. But <laughs> it was the experience. <laughs> yeah, you were the experience. <laughs> but we did have experienced leaders, too, now. You yeah. know? And I'll be the first to say that, funny, when you're in a situation like that, it becomes life or death. Mm -hmm. You learn pretty fast. Yeah. And you need to really become a good salesperson to sell this program 
the people is going to be in your squad. Yeah. They need to yeah. believe in you. So I think that by itself became a key element that even to today, you know, whatever we do, we need to still have that inner relationship with our comrades. Yeah? I think I'm, I, you know, these lessons learned from the Ken Burns series, from your own experiences, my experience, <laughs> from our era. Uh, somebody said, if you don't know the history, you're doomed to repeat it. Mm -hmm. And I kind of worry that we're doing that because people are oblivious, despite huge amount of social media. And uh, somehow we have to evolve some strategies that are going to, you know, not have to suffer the most painful parts of that history again. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a marketing job, I would think. Uh, more people are concerned with taking pictures of their lunch and sending it on to their friends. This is what I had for lunch, yeah. as opposed to the real issues that are, that are facing us. <laughs> Uh, yep. I, I don't know how you sell that. How do you get people into, into that? And I think what you and I have discussed before as far as national service, I think that brings more engagement into things. There are people who know how to do branding and advertising and all that. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't we apply that to national service in the same way that it's sure. applied to, you know, sure. Diet Coke? Well, and you need a leader yeah. to yeah. energize oh, the yeah. country. <laughs> yeah. uh, most of us grew up in the... In the early 60s, and uh, where you had the Kennedy administration, not so much whether you support them or not, but the spirit that came through the country, the, the old, not what you want for yourself, but for your country type thing, really covered the generation on it. And it, it can, leaders can come in many different forms, but someone who would energize the people again to want to do something like that, that this is important. And uh, it goes right along with restoring some confidence in government because. All, the, all the, the numbers show we're not, we don't, we've lost that. I think we could probably take this on for about another three hours, at least today. <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't have enough time, so we're going to have to end it right here. We would like to have some feedback. If you have some comments, please send an email to 808vietnamvets at gmail.com. I would like to thank the staff here at Think Tech Hawaii for all their support and assistance. Truly, without them, this program would not be possible. Please come back again next week for another issue of It Never Got Quiet. Mahalo.